Timing doesn't get much worse than this. Space Camp is a movie from 1986 about a bunch of kids attending a NASA space camp and accidentally get launched into space. If you know your history, you know exactly where this is going. This movie had so much going for it. It had a great cast, great premise. It had a lot of high-end production around it. This movie was intended to be a perfect family PG movie that everyone could enjoy. But things wouldn't work out that way. This is a look back at Space Camp, the movie that was doomed before it even opened. Do you remember the Simpsons episode when Homer goes to space? This isn't far off the intent of Space Camp. In the classic episode, people were doing anything to avoid having to watch another boring space launch on TV. NASA needed to create more public interest in the space program, and this is why Homer ends up able to travel to space. This was a real thing happening in the mid-80s. Space travel had been a thrill through the 1960s and 70s, but had become a bit stale going into the 80s. NASA wanted to create more public interest in the space program, and this meant getting the attention of kids. It's not that NASA created the Space Camp movie, they just played a big part in its production. The goal was to make a real-life space movie. The space-related movies at the time were things like Flight of the Navigator and The Arrivals. These were a bit too science fiction-y, so it was thought that a more grounded approach might resonate with kids. Space Camp would be set in reality as much as that was possible, but NASA would be involved with the writing and production to make sure it was accurate and properly represented the agency. One of the main goals of Space Camp was to inspire kids to study science and space. So if you've never seen this movie, let's take a look at the plot. Atlantis, do you copy? This is Atlantis. Radio check satisfactory. Over. <laughs> Space Camp. Robert Pickett, Purple Camp. America's real training ground for future astronauts. I'm going to be the first female shuttle commander. Catherine, you're not a passenger. You're a pilot. Buy it. Do you want Space Camp? My father wants Space Camp, but I want uh, my head examined. Please return your seats and tray tables to their full upright position. Remember everything I read. It's a real drag sometimes. What did you get on your SATs? 800s. And what is your name? Rudy Tyler, ma'am. Spit it out, Rudy. Rudy Tyler, ma'am! The green one right next to the red. At 0900 Thursday, we're going to test fire the engines, and some of you will be able to sit in this. <laughs> Earth to Catherine. Stand, Stand by, by for main engine test. She's all yours. Four, three, two, go for main engine test. We have main engine test. We have overheat on booster B. What does that mean? We can't stop it. Booster B is near ignition. It's going to light. Get that thing operational. Go for launch now. We're not authorized. Light it or they're going to die. What's happening? Now! Light it! An impossible mistake launched them into space. The adventure of their lives will be getting back home. Space Camp. So, four teenagers visit a NASA space camp for three weeks in the summer. They are there to learn about NASA and mimic the training that astronauts go through. Their instructor is an astronaut who is bitter that she hasn't yet gone to space. They meet a robot named Jinx, voiced by 1980s voice icon Frank Welker. If you don't know about Frank Welker, go back into my earlier episodes and hear my 
episode all about this amazing man, the voice of the 80s, honestly. Jinx takes everything he hears literally. And when he hears one of the kids say, I wish I was in space, he is able to trigger the launch sequence while they're sitting in the space shuttle Atlantis. The shuttle hasn't been cleared for space activity and doesn't have enough oxygen or radio power. The kids now have to figure out how to stay alive while in space. Mission Control has got a hold of the shuttle and is trying to bring it back by autopilot. One of the kids is trapped outside the shuttle, but they override the autopilot to rescue her. Now they have missed their chance for a proper reentry and they have to come up with a plan that involves them trying to land in New Mexico. Spoiler alert, they make it back safely. You may have never heard of Space Camp, but there was a lot of excitement behind this movie. First off, it features a pretty stellar cast. To begin with, you have future Mrs. Travolta, Kelly Preston. Then you have Leah Thompson fresh off of Back to the Future. She would also have Howard the Duck opening in 1986, so that was a whole thing. If you don't know about the Howard the Duck movie, please go back and listen to my episode all about it for a look into one of the greatest train wrecks ever. Next, you had Tom Skerritt, who would be a part of Top Gun. Also, Larry B. Scott was in it, who you may remember from Revenge of the Nerds. Kate Capshaw is also in it, who you may know as Willie Scott, the nightclub singer in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Last but not least, you had a very young Joaquin Phoenix, who went by Leaf Phoenix in those days. So the cast was pretty epic, and they were all put in place. Space Camp would also feature some Academy Award-winning cinematographers to capture all the images. And in one of the biggest wins the movie got, they landed legendary composer John Williams to create the score. You could probably hear a bit of his influence there in the trailer, a bit of that Harry Potter, Home Alone-ish style. So everything was in place. What could possibly go wrong? It was a bitter cold but sparkling clear morning at Cape Canaveral. Here at the last seconds of the countdown. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle Mission and it has cleared the tower. All the communications between the shuttle and mission control indicated everything was going fine. There was a sense of relief that the much delayed flight was finally underway. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. It happened just over one minute into flight. One minute, 15 seconds, velocity 2,900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. From mission control, silence. Then the bland, chilling report. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see. This is January 28th, 1986. If this is somehow brand new to you, if you're younger, this was a day of national tragedy. This was the day the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded 73 seconds after takeoff. An entire nation was watching live at home, including pretty much every school in the country. For the first time ever, a civilian was on board a NASA flight. This was the move by NASA to create more public interest in trips to space. And for kids of the 80s, this is really one of the first where were you when moments. And speaking of the civilian, that was school teacher Krista McAuliffe, who was chosen from tens of thousands of people to be the first civilian in space. But she wasn't actually the first choice. This story, I know, seems a little unbelievable. But if you've seen the documentary, I Am Big Bird, the Carol Spinney story, you know all about this. 
Since NASA wanted to create more appeal with kids, the thought was that Big Bird himself would join the crew of the Challenger. Carol Spinney, the actor inside Big Bird, shares in the documentary how this was one of the original plans. When they found out the eight-foot-tall suit was too big for the shuttle, they had to scrap the idea. This is when they decided to go with a civilian and ultimately Krista McCullough. I was only nine when this happened, but... I remember it like it was yesterday. Again, one of those first where were you when moments. The country was in shock and disbelief. Space travel was supposed to be safe. How could this happen? It would take a while for the pain to go away. And the movie Space Camp was opening in just a few months Now you have one of the biggest marketing nightmares in film history. The Challenger has just exploded, and you now have a movie all about kids flying to space and having to survive on board the space shuttle. In one of the all-time worst timing departments, 20th Century Fox now had a complete nightmare on its hands. The release date for Space Camp was June 6, 1986, barely four months after the accident. And since you have to start promoting a movie a few months before it's released, marketing had to be up by early April. How in the hell do you market a movie about a NASA space shuttle when the explosion of one of them has just decimated the entire country? This is what the marketers of Space Camp had to face. There was no playbook to use for this situation. Where do you even start? The accident was still too fresh in people's minds, and now comes this movie that's going to completely trigger them. Again, where do you even start? 20th Century Fox couldn't ignore the premise of this movie, kids going to space on the space shuttle. The only thing they could do is focus on the underlying tone of the movie, adventure. Space Camp was kind of like a Goonies in space situation. Maybe if they focused on that aspect and less on the shuttle, they could find a way to promote it. So before we get into the public backlash to this thing, let's take a quick break. Welcome to the Jungle was a great 80s song, but a jungle is not the best look when it comes to your personal grooming. Cupid works hard in February, but our friends at Manscaped are working harder than ever to ensure your Valentine's Day is one to remember. Don't turn this day of romance into Independence Day and get in control with their performance package 4.0, which includes their signature Lawnmower 4.0. This February, join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code 80s for 20% off plus free shipping. They say love is blind, but not when you're walking around looking like George the Animal Steel. And Valentine's Day is the pivotal day to up your grooming habits. And the Performance Package 4.0 comes with all the tools to leave you fresher than Don Johnson in Miami Vice. Unfortunately for him, he didn't have the signature lawnmower 4.0, which is an electric trimmer designed for hair on loose skin. It has advanced skin-safe technology to reduce cuts and nicks on your boys. This package also comes with the Weed Whacker for your nose and ears, and Manscaped even throws in two free gifts, their Shed Travel Bag and Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs to keep your boys cool and collected. Manscaped has you covered this Valentine's Day as they don't just focus on your nether regions. Their refined cologne is the cherry on top for the perfect date package. It has a masculine, yet light scent, and is Pepe Le Pew approved. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code 80s at Manscaped.com. Dot com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code 80s, 80s, and turn welcome to the jungle into Paradise City. And now, back to the show. Since Space Camp was a summertime movie, they could play up that tone. This was an adventure that just happened to be set in space. Some of the early promotional material played up this fact with the slogan, The Summer's Greatest Adventure. They also tried to capitalize on the fact this movie was about the dreams of kids and their pursuit of a goal. The tone of the movie was about growth and accomplishment. Maybe this would work. Another marketing poster used the tagline, it started as a dream, it became a fantastic adventure. 
there was no good way to effectively promote this movie and people didn't respond well. Many thought it was way too soon. Many others thought they were exploiting the tragedy to promote the movie. This wasn't the case. It was just a terrible coincidence. The movie had started filming in 1985. It was also so delayed that it pushed the release date up. The movie also used real footage of the Challenger for the launch scenes. It wasn't trying to exploit the tragedy. It had been intended to promote NASA. You have to remember, NASA was involved with this movie. Everyone involved with the film tried to be as careful as possible not to exploit the tragedy in any way. But the public didn't see it that way. This was a pretty hopeless situation. In his initial review, Roger Ebert said that space camp is doomed before it even begins, unquote. It's too bad because this should have been a huge summer movie, especially for families and younger people. The summer of 1986 was a great one for movies with options like Aliens, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Top Gun, Stand By Me, The Fly, Transformers the Movie, Flight of the Navigator, and Labyrinth. Space Camp would have fit perfectly during the summer. It had that kind of appeal that could attract a wide range of audiences. It also had drawing power in Leah Thompson, Kelly Preston, and the other kids that would have attracted a large youth viewership. But the stigma on the movie was too much to bear, and Space Camp got crushed at the box office. It didn't even crack $10 million. It was made on a budget of around $20 million, not including the marketing, so it was a huge financial failure. And just speaking of movies from, you know, say the summer of 1986, I did a whole episode where I broke down what I think are the best summer for movies in the 80s, just if you're interested in what came out when. And it's an interesting look back. Was there ever going to be a good time to release Space Camp? Honestly, I don't think so. For the next two to three years, it would have been met with the same response. Or it would have been too jarring for people. These are the days when things didn't wash out of the news cycle in 24 hours. Also, it was a tragedy the likes of which most people had never seen. And it could never not be associated with the tragedy. They maybe could have waited and released it the next year, but it probably wouldn't have made a difference. It's too bad because it's a good movie that connected with many young people. It would find an audience years later, but it could have been a much bigger hit. And the initial intent of the movie worked. Leah Thompson says how people come up to her to this day and tell her that Space Camp inspired them to study science. It was an influence on many inventors and physicists. Space Camp could have been in the same category as Flight of the Navigator or Adventures in Babysitting. At best, it could have been Goonies in Space, but it wasn't meant to be. This was a lose-lose situation. Short of not releasing it at all, there was no good time to put it out or any effective way to market it. It probably shouldn't have been released that summer, but it's obviously too late for that. It could have been a straight-to-video release and that might have worked. It did eventually find a bit of an audience and the people who discovered it have always loved it. Space Camp exists as a movie that just had to take the loss. There's nothing you can do to prepare for a situation like this. It's horrific timing and you just have to move on from it. It's unfortunate though, as Space Camp deserved to be a bigger hit than it was. So let's finish it there. I hope you like this look back on just, like I said, a no-win situation with a movie that should have been a hit. There was nothing they could do. Um, you know, a marketing story, a marketing nightmare story that's been sort of used and studied and how you navigate a situation, like I said, when there's no playbook, it, all these things happening all at once and just a crazy time and a crazy period in history and in, and in movies on, on a smaller scale. Like you have this tiny little issue of how you deal with a movie, but, you know, movies are there to 
inspire, entertain, influence us. And that's what Space Camp was all about. So uh, we'll finish it off with uh, patreon.com. This is the platform, if you're in a position to do so, where you can support small independent shows like this for as little as a few dollars a month. So we all love podcasts. You're here listening to this one. I love them. I listen to a bunch. But for these smaller shows like me, it's harder to stand out in this whole new podcast world. So you're up against celebrities, companies, and huge podcast networks. So patreon.com is a way to help these smaller little shows. So the thing is where you support it for a few dollars a month, the difference is you get audio rewards with it. And there are different tiers. And with each tier comes a different reward. So at the Boba Fett level, like I shared here before, you get access to the Everything 80s Movie Club where I review the good, the bad, and the ugly of 1980s movies. And we do all sorts of things over there, share, you know, random Saturday morning cartoons you may have forgotten about, like putting up full episodes, sharing movie behind the scenes stuff. There's there's a whole bunch. So if you want to learn more, you can go to patreon.com slash 80. So that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash 80S or wherever you're listening to this on, there should be a link in the show notes or the description of this episode that'll take you right there. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you for listening. I will be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.